Father, thank you for the privilege we have to open your word together this morning. But especially we ask that your spirit would speak to our hearts. Help us catch what you're trying to say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The meaning of fire in scripture. Some of you have been here for the past three out of these four presentations. Some of you might not have been. A little review. Uh, we saw the first time that the fire that consumes and destroys is eternal because God's glorious presence is eternal, which explains why Jesus said the wicked will be burned with everlasting fire. That doesn't mean they will burn forever because the Bible's clear. They burn to ashes. They're gone. But God's glorious presence is everlasting, and that's where the fire came from. He doesn't go away. So it really is everlasting fire, although it isn't everlasting punishment or punishing, uh, the fire is. And then point two, the same fire blesses God's people and destroys sinners. And we looked that time at the sea of glass where we just read from Revelation 15, where it calls it the sea of glass mingled with fire. Revelation 4, it's the sea of glass before the throne. Revelation 20, it's the lake of fire before the throne. In Revelation 15, it's the sea of glass mingled with fire before the throne. And that's where we pick up God's people. And we're coming back to that one today. But we also notice in Daniel 7, 9, God's throne has uh, burning wheels and a fiery stream flows out from before him. But when you go to Revelation 22, 1, what kind of stream comes out from his throne? The river of water of life. Is it the river of water of life? Yes. Is it a fiery stream? Well, because of his glory, everything in his presence is on fire. The stones in his presence are on fire. Moses comes out of his presence and he's glowing brighter than any light bulb you've ever looked at. Because I can look at a light bulb for a little bit, but the Israelites said, we can't stand it. Cover your face, please. Because he was glowing from having been in God's presence. Things in God's presence start glowing because they're in his presence. And, and the river of, of life to the wicked, is a, it's like a fiery stream uh, when it comes out. Point three, the fire that flashes out from God's presence, either to consume a sacrifice or to in judgment on, on a sinner, it always consumes either the sin or the sinner, or, well, if not us, then Jesus, the substitute for the sinner. We cannot come to God apart from Jesus or we will be consumed by the glory of his presence. We can't just march into God's presence. We can't just come on in. We have to come through Jesus who's taken the fire for us. Today, the song of the Lamb. Now, it's important to understand the biblical uh, concept of death here because it changes the flavor of what Jesus did when he died. It's not just someone dies and their soul goes on to heaven. That's what many people believe. But the scripture is quite clear. The dead know nothing. The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Uh, they will be no more forever, Ezekiel 28. Psalm 37 says, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. The place where the wicked were is gone. That's kind of gone, isn't it? Even the spot where they were is gone. There's nothing left of the wicked. Last time we saw that the fire on the altar represents that final fire that destroys the wicked. Now let's go back and take a look at Revelation 15 again, uh, where we read for our scripture reading this morning. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. To the righteous, it's the sea of glass. To the wicked, it's a lake of fire. It is both, depending on our relationship with God. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, who are these? 
These are God's people, the redeemed. These people stand on the sea of glass having harps of God. Now, it just said at the first part of this verse that it's the sea of glass, what? Mingled with fire. But for the redeemed, it doesn't say they stand on the sea of glass mingled with fire. It says they stand on the sea of glass. To them, it's just the sea of glass. It's a glorious place in God's presence, but to them, it is not a sea of glass mingled with fire. It is just the sea of glass, which is interesting. In the same verse, it, it describes it two different ways because it depends on who is experiencing it. They are in harmony with God. For them, it's the sea of glass. And what are they doing there? They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now, the song of Moses takes us back to the Red Sea, and we've looked at this a little before. This is the Red Sea uh, between uh, Sinai Peninsula and, and Egypt. You can see some big ships out there in the kind of hazy day it was when I was there. And as they crossed the sea, it parted for the Israelites so they could go through. Uh, and then it closed back in on the Egyptians and destroyed them when they were trying to pursue the Israelites. After they were on the farther shore, safe from the uh, Egyptians, Miriam led the women in a song of victory, the song of Moses. It's in, it's in uh, Exodus there for us. Uh, and the, the, the gist of the song is God has delivered us from our enemies. Praise the Lord. We are safe. He has saved us. But it's also the song of the Lamb that they sing on the sea of glass in Revelation 15. So the song of Moses takes our mind back to Exodus, where the sea delivers God's people from those who are trying to destroy them. Uh, and the sea of glass mingled with fire that delivers God's people in the end is the glorious presence of God that destroys sinners, delivers his people. And they are blessed in his presence, which is a destruction to the wicked. It's the same sea that destroys the wicked that blesses God's people. And that's the, the song of Moses coming back again. God's people delivered from their pursuers. At, at the Red Sea, when Israel was crossing there, they had just had a, an experience that centered on a lamb. What lamb was that? The Passover lamb. What did they do? Well, they sacrificed the lamb and they put the blood on the posts beside and over the doorway and they stayed in the house until the angel had passed over and then they were free to go without experiencing the death of the firstborn. The Passover lamb. Well, what about the Passover lamb? Interesting in scripture, God was very specific in saying the Passover lamb must be roasted with fire. You don't, you don't boil it. You don't do anything else with it. You must roast it with fire. Now we've been studying about fire in scripture and that's going to tell us something about this Passover lamb. They were delivered by the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, and we also are delivered by the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of our heart. Has the lamb been slain? Yes. And in Israel, many lambs were slain, but not everyone was saved from the destroying angel. Why? They didn't have the blood on their doorposts. Not enough that the lamb has died. We have to apply the blood in our own hearts. We have to accept it and receive it and have it as a living thing. And then we are protected from the death that comes through. But why must it be roasted with fire? Well, uh, Jesus is our Passover, Paul says, and he took the fire for us. We've seen that already. We've looked at that a bit. We saw that the fire that consumes the sacrificial lamb on the altar of burnt offering represents the final destruction of sin and sinners. And Jesus taking that for us is part of the symbol of that sacrifice on the altar. Well, here the Passover lamb is saying that same thing. The Passover lamb is going to be roasted with fire, meaning Jesus takes our place in the fire of destruction that really belongs to us as sinners, it belongs to all sinners, but 
us also because we are also singers. It's ours. But he takes that for us. Hebrews 2.9 says that he tasted death for every man. Now, he didn't taste the first death for us. How do you know? We still have funerals. We are all still subject to death. Uh, our faith in Jesus in the main now does not prevent the first death coming to us. A few exceptions, uh, but in the main, it doesn't stop that. Jesus didn't take the first death from us, so what did he take? Second death. Second death. Well, that's the one you don't come back from. We come through that fire because he took our place in that fire. We're going to look at a little more what that means. Hebrews 12, 2. And I think we need to look at this together. I'm pretty sure some of you have heard some of this from me somewhere in the time I've been here. For some, it will be a bit of review. Uh, I hope this is good for you the second time around. Hebrews 12, verse 2. He's talking about running the race in verse 1. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'll tell you the picture I used to have when I read this verse and why it changed. I used to see Jesus with the redeemed enjoying heaven together because he bought it for us. Okay. Is that true? Yes, that's true. But buried in this verse is something else. That means that's not really the picture he saw when he died. It's close. It was my idea of what he saw. In here it says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. There's something buried in the Greek that doesn't show correctly in the English very easily. That word for, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The word for there is not the usual word we would use. It's the Greek word anti. Now, anti, anti is against, right? Opposite. And what it really is saying here is rather than the joy, he chose the cross. Now, using for in that way, we sometimes do it in English. I'll trade you a baseball cards, I'll trade you a Mickey Mantle for a Babe Ruth. This one for that one. That's the meaning of for in here. This one for that one. Instead of this, that. He could have had the joy, and who did that belong to? Him. Instead, he chose the cross, and who did that belong to? Us. Us. He had a choice. He could have gone home to heaven. It was his. It wouldn't have been wrong if he did. You could hardly blame him if he did. Man, I'm glad he didn't. Because if he went home to heaven, we're stuck with the cross. What he doesn't take, we get. It's ours. And if he doesn't take it, it's still ours. Instead of the joy, which he could have had and it was his, he chose to take the cross so we could have the joy. Amen. But to give us the joy, he had to take the cross in its fullness. The cross is a tree. The Old Testament says anyone hung on a tree is accursed. It's one of the reasons why the Jewish leaders wanted Jesus crucified. 
because that would put him on a cross, on a tree. And then he would be accursed. And that meant he cannot be in God's kingdom. Never going to be there. And they said, yes. We don't ever want to turn a corner in heaven and bump into him again. We want him hung on a tree. It's his second death. You don't come back. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus knew he was coming back. He told the disciples multiple times on the way to Jerusalem after the third day, I will rise again. But when he got into Calvary and Gethsemane, things were different. Things were different. Uh, and we're going to read that in, in, in a bit here. Jesus was choosing. Okay. That's a little intimidating. That wasn't supposed to happen. But anyway, let's go to Philippians 2, another familiar passage. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Another translation did not think it a thing to be clung to grasped as a, as a robber would grab something and run, grabbing it, holding on to it, but made himself of no reputation or also could say emptied himself, emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant coming in the likeness of men. These are kind of the steps down that Jesus takes and humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Do you notice that death and death of the cross are two different steps? And after you've stepped down to the death, there's one more step down. That's the death of the cross. And he took that one too. He didn't stop at death. He took the death of the cross, the anathema. You're not going to be there in God's kingdom. So in Hebrews 12, where it says, for the joy that was set before him, he chose the cross. Instead of the joy, he chose the cross. And the picture of joy that carried Jesus through was not the picture of him with us in heaven, it was us in heaven without him because he was out so we could be in. He was anathema. He took the cross. That's the choice he made. When he was choosing between joy and cross, it was anathema. It was the second death. You don't come back that he was choosing. And he was willing to do that so we could have the joy. So he saw us enjoying heaven. And he's not in the picture because that's how we got in. It's when he pulled out of that picture, we get in. That's how we get in, as he steps out. Daniel 9. Verse 26. Carol, could you run and get me a Kleenex? <laughs> Thank you. Thought about doing that earlier, didn't get it done. Daniel 9, 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. One of my seminary professors, who's a lot smarter about these things than I am, studies chiastic structure. Do you know what chiastic structure is? Like, chiastic structure is based on this, the letter X in, in Greek, chiasm. And, and the logic of a chiastic structure starts with little things and works into the middle where the most important point is, and then it backs out in a reflective pattern that follows the same steps back out to something parallel to where you started. And the main point is right in the middle. 
right? You, you, you walk into it, and then you back out from it. He pointed out that Daniel 9.26 happens to be the middle of the chiastic structure of the second half of the book of Daniel. So this is the middle. This is it for the second half of the book of Daniel. This verse right here. And it centers in the words, not for himself. When, when you get it in, in the Hebrew, it, it says, after the 62 weeks, it's kind of a longish phrase, Messiah will be cut off. It's a shorter phrase. And then, but not for himself, is just va'en lo. Six letters. Two words. And it means va and ain not. Lo to him. And, and not for him, nothing for him. Uh, and and, and it, translators and commentators have, have struggled with what this is trying to say. What is it that was not for him? Uh, and so one of the ideas uh, is uh, that uh, it, it, it's because he is in poverty. And scripture affirms the son of man had nowhere to lay his head. The, the, the birds do and the foxes do, but I don't, says Jesus. But his, his poverty is probably not the main point of Jesus' life. It might be significant. It may teach us something. But it's not the main point of what he's doing. Uh, how about there's nobody there to support him. He's all by himself. Well, the Bible says he tried the wine press alone. That was also true. But the fact that, that all of us fled like cockroaches when the light came on at his crucifixion, what we did isn't the center point. It's what he did. It's the main point. And what the Hebrew is really saying is he had nothing left. Nothing left to give. Because he gave absolutely everything, including his future existence. Anybody familiar with Jack Sequeira? A few hands. Jack Sequeira said, Jesus said goodbye to life forever. Goodbye to life forever. He chose the second death for us. Um, wonderful technological moment. My device says, we ran into a problem. We need to restart. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so let's see what we can do. So, I think for a long time I came short in understanding what Jesus did. Now, I think I always, well, for a long time, I should say, for a long time I have understood that his death paid the debt of my sin, released me from death, and provided eternal life for me. That's kind of like the Song of Moses. I have been rescued from destruction. Thank you. And it's a good thing to be thankful for. But it misses a piece. Because it looks at what Jesus took from me. He, he, he took away 
the, the negatives of sin from me. But it misses what he took upon himself to do that. Because he didn't just take it from me, he took it for me. He tasted death for every man. The second death you don't come back from was what he experienced. It was as if he was not going to come back at that moment. Uh, Desire of Ages 25. He suffered the death which was ours that we might receive the life that was his. And then in Gethsemane, Desire of Ages 686, Christ was now standing in a different attitude from that in which he had ever stood before. The scripture says he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. He made him to be sin for us. When, when he tasted that second death, he was choosing not to come back as it seemed at that moment. Now before he knew he was coming back and he did come back and the picture of him enjoying heaven with us is real and it will happen. But that's not the one that sustained him, not the one that sustained him. Because he was stepping out so that we could be in. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish the sinner will feel. He felt the second death. He tasted the second death. To him, when he did it, it was the second death. And that's what he chose instead of the joy of heaven that belonged to him. Instead of the joy, he chose the cross. So, his decision is made he will save man at any cost to himself. Amen. Amen. And when we understand that, I think we've got the first verse of the song of the Lamb. The Lamb chose Second death, so we can have life. He chose to be out, so we can be in. He chose not to be a part of the picture of joy in heaven, so that we could have the joy of heaven. So, Everlasting fire is everlasting because it flashes out from God's eternal glory. It must be eternal because he is eternal. And the same fire which delivers God's people also destroys sinners. And the key is whether we're in harmony with God or not. At the fiery furnace, the guards were destroyed by the same fire that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked in with Jesus picture of the second coming. God's people in his presence, blessed by his glory, the wicked destroyed by the brightness of his presence.
wasn't going to be on the slides. I'm going to go to there because it's in my paper notes. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. An interesting little spot where this concept came back. I wasn't expecting it in Psalm 139. Psalm 139 includes, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, talking about the, the uh, development of the fetus is the primary uh, thing that it's talking about there. Psalm 139, verse 7, where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell or Sheol, behold, you are there. David. If I make my bed in the grave, the place of the dead, and, and I see David pulling back the covers to lay down in his tomb. He's going to die now. But it's much more colorful in the Hebrew. Because in the Hebrew, when it says, behold, you are there, it starts with the little word hine. Hine is used all over the place. Uh, Jacob says to Joseph, I want to send you to see how your brothers are doing. And, and Joseph's answer is, hine, here I am, here I am. It's behold, the angel of the Lord. Uh, behold, startlement, um, uh, it's a, a, an all-purpose expressive word, including surprise. Anybody from the upper Midwest? You know what ufta is? Well, sorry. It's, it's, a, it's a Scandahoovian expression. It's like, what? And so hine has got some of this what in it. Uh, and, and David peels back the covers, ready to roll into the grave. And he says, what? Hine ka. The ka ending is a pronoun. It means you. And what he really said is, what? You? It's you? Somebody's in my grave already. But the most startling thing is not that my grave has somebody in it. It's who it is. It's you? You? In my grave? You beat me to my grave? Yeah. Jesus beat us to our grave. Now, I think that's absolutely cool. Absolutely cool. He went to the lowest of the low. He went to the place that is designed as the destruction of the devil and his angels. The lowest spot on the lowest corner of the universe. And he went there for us. And what that says to me is, at our worst moment, at our worst moment, we cannot fall lower than his love has already gone for us. Amen. We can't do it. You can't fall below the bottom of his love. What? It's you? Yeah, it's him. It's, him. it's always him. We should know it's always him. He's the one that makes that possible. That's not coming back. It's dead <laughs> for the moment. There's another quotation from Alan White. I'm going to have to wing it on this one. She says that during his life, Jesus was sustained by seeing the redeemed enjoying heaven. Now, it doesn't say in that passage that he's in or out of the picture. But the focus isn't him, it's us. He's doing it for us. So we will be there. And then he hears the redeemed singing 
the song of Moses and the Lamb. He heard us sing that song. We're not there yet. We haven't sung that song yet, but we're going to. And he heard that. And knowing that we would be there singing that song was enough to carry him through the troubles that he went through in his life. Our joy in heaven did indeed sustain Jesus. But the picture didn't always have him in the picture. Somewhere between World War I and II, I think it was. I've tried to find the story again. I can't get back to it. Some of you heard me tell it. Allied Navy was doing night maneuvers. And one of the submarines running on the surface, one of the surface ships ran over their tail end, put a big hole in it. Tail went down right away. They, they managed to flip the cover down on the conning tower and dive down. And as the water was coming up from the back of the ship, everybody scrambled out of the, out of the aft torpedo room. And the last two guys out tried to close the door. Now, this was a World War II submarine. And, and the doors are a little awkward on those things. I don't know if you've ever been to the German submarine at, at uh, Chicago at the museum there, but I've been in it. And, and, and the doors between the sections uh, are, are a little more than knee high at the bottom and a little less than head high at the top. So you stick a leg over and you duck through and then you pull your other leg in. And then there's a cast iron door you can swing shut from the back room toward the rest, so the pressure of that one flooding holds the door shut. But because the tail end was down and the door was cast iron and heavy, it was not possible for the last two guys to shut that door. They didn't have enough power to lift that heavy door up and shut it. So they went up to the center of the submarine where the rest of the survivors were and they said, we couldn't shut the door. And everybody knows we're gonna die. Well, they're not dead yet. Water hasn't got them yet. And people who aren't dead yet try again. So they went back to try again. And when they got to the door, it was shut. And they were rescued. But when they thought it over, they realized there was one more guy back there they didn't know about. And when he got to the door, he realized, if I go through the door, we will all die. So he stayed on the other side and he pushed it shut. And he died and they lived. And that's what Jesus did for us. He locked the door with himself on the outside so that we could live. And when I see that, I can begin to glory in the cross like Paul said he did. I never used to glory in the cross. The, the, the sermons I heard all focused on the physical suffering and, and something about it just never resonated with me. And I don't know if you know how embarrassing it is to a pastor to say to yourself, I can't glory in the cross. I don't know how. It's a little embarrassing. When I finally saw that Jesus chose the second death, he chose to be out of the picture so we could have the joy. He took the, he took the second death of the cross. When I begin to see that, I have begun to be able to glory in the cross. What an amazing thing he has done. He emptied himself of absolutely everything, absolutely everything. You know, back at the beginning of the great controversy, the devil said, God is ultimately selfish. I've been there. I know this. He creates worlds and they praise him. He makes people so they'll love him. Do the worlds praise him? Yes. Do people love him? Yes. 
And it's possible for the devil to twist that and say, see, I told you he's selfish. <laughs> told you so. But when we get to the cross, we get to the moment where God shows his love most clearly. His unselfish love, his agape love, as the New Testament calls it, where there's nothing coming back for him. If Jesus was dying on the cross with at that moment the knowledge I'm coming back in three days, that's a far different thing than I'm dying and I'm not coming back. Now you could talk me into doing the three day thing for selfish reasons. If an angel said to me, Jim, Next weekend, there's going to be a mob come to the church and they're going to beat you up and kill you. But we'll raise you a couple days later, take you to heaven, are you in? And I would say, I want to talk to my family, but pencil me in. Why? Ultimately, I have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Why would I not do this? from a selfish human perspective. Why would I not do that? That's not what Jesus did. He wasn't doing anything from a selfish human perspective. It was the most selfless moment the universe has ever seen. There was nothing left for him. Nothing left for him. He gave absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. So we could have the joy of heaven, even if he's not there. Now, praise the Lord. That's how it tasted. That's how it felt. That's what he chose. But that's not where it ends. Because he was raised on the third day, and he is back, and he will be there in heaven, and we will sing his praises, and he can sing with us. Or not if he chooses. But he'll be there, and we'll be there. But it's because of his love that he gave everything he has and is. The song of the Lamb. Lord, it is indeed amazing love that you were willing to take the cross and let us have the joy. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name.